Thanks everybody for joining the uh, ABM Maturity Model webinar with ABMA. Um, Vincent DeCastro, I'm the founder and president here at uh, the ABM agency. I've got 20 years of search marketing experience, 12 years of B2B marketing experience, and then I've been doing account-based marketing for the past seven years. With me today, um, got Sarah and Chris. I'll let them introduce themselves real quick. Hi, I'm Sarah Llewellyn. I'm the director of ABM strategy here at ABMA. I have about 15 years total of uh, ABM experience, uh, working with many different enterprise customers and clients, um, mainly in the tech, healthcare, and fintech space, but some in manufacturing as well. And then we also have Chris here. Hi, I'm a senior ABM strategist here at ABMA. Um, I've been in a B2B marketing for about 15 years, but um, doing nothing but ABM dedicated uh, campaigns for about 10 years. So I'm pumped to be here today. Great. Let's get this ball rolling. So we're going to start it out with one of my favorite quotes. Um, that I think is very much related to ABM, and that is a goal without a plan is just a wish. It, to me, speaks to the nature of taking a, an ad hoc approach to ABM. Um, to use a phrase that I've heard in the past, it kind of fits into the category of random acts of marketing. And so what we've seen, what I've seen personally over the past seven years, working with a lot of different organizations from startups through mid-market all the way through enterprise is that true ABM that is actually successful really requires um, a great deal of planning. And so really knowing where you're trying to get to with your, your ABM campaign, um, understanding where you are currently in terms of your organization, and then what are the steps that are going to be required to reach your desired state is really what this webinar is all about. So let's go ahead and keep this, this moving, Chris. All right, ABM, quick refresher. A lot of us know ABM, obviously. Um, that's probably why you're here, but it's nice to just have a quick overview so we can kind of level set what we're doing here today. Um, this is a slide we love, we love to put out there. It's called ABM at a glance, and it's kind of all of the things that everybody wants to know in one place. Um, Really, the funnel stages that we all kind of live and breathe in in B2B marketing are still have a place in ABM and how we kind of talk about them are, is this a slight difference? Um, a lot of folks are doing that one-to-many demand gen awareness sort of campaigns. It can be targeted and still feel like ABM. It's just kind of going to be a lighter targeting basically based because of scale, right? And a one-to-many demand gen program is probably gonna go out to massive amounts of groups. A consideration at a one to few, getting a little bit further down your funnel, that's gonna be, you know these people better, you know your ICP, you know um, what kind of groups you should be targeting and who we should be talking to. Um, and so that's great for a one to few, but keeping it scalable still at somewhere between 10 to 25 accounts, that's a pretty nice little range. And you you can kind of keep those accounts feeling like they're getting a customized experience, but at scale, right? Um, and then that one-to-one, -one, of course, everybody loves a one-to-one. -one. I think that is the thing that really puts ABM on the map and why people really love it, is it's that one-to-one -one interaction with your accounts. You are speaking directly to them, um, making sure to fulfill their needs and talking to them about their pain points. Um, and then you can like slowly identify where your solution or product fits in with their needs. So that's really the, the wonderful thing about ABM is it all comes together, lots of targeted approach. Of course, there's many channels you can take and there's lots of ABM tactics. We These are just like a small number of some of our more popular ABM tactics, but honestly, nothing is off the board. Um, I've seen some crazy ideas and I love a crazy idea my team will tell you. So I think that ABM tactics are are the most fun to do, and it brings that little light to B2B marketing that can be so boring. Um, I'm only going to touch briefly on advocacy and cross-sell, but if you are targeting all of these folks so well already, they are going to be more likely to go and tell your competitor, uh, not your competitors, <laughs> they're going to go and tell their other accounts, the other people you're trying to get into, and try to bring them in. They're going to be excited because they want to see you do well, because because they are, are getting that 
um, targeted experience. So if you're doing ABM really great, um, they, your, your uh, clients and customers should ultimately be selling for you in the long run. Great, thanks, Chris. So to dig in a little bit deeper and get under the hood, um, and there's gonna be a lot more information related to this further throughout the, the presentation that we've got planned, but just wanna level set a little bit on these three different types of B2B marketing approaches. And we're all familiar with this stuff. And what we see a lot of times is that organizations, these, um, these three different tactics are, are a little bit siloed or sometimes often very siloed. So demand gen, um, top of the funnel, really awareness-based. Um, I know a lot of folks don't like the term MQL, but we're just gonna use that because it's the easiest way for everyone to know what we're talking about. These are marketing qualified leads, but traditionally from the demand gen perspective, they might not actually be ready for sales engagement. They might not be into the sales process yet internally at their organization. So they might not be really ready to, to interface with sales in a meaningful way. Jumping over to lead gen, um, this is where I have just a tremendous amount of experience. And this, you know, the goal of lead gen is to be able to uh, acquire those form fills. Folks that are coming in saying, yes, you know, I do want to find out more about your product or your solution. Um, how can it benefit my company? Does it solve the challenges I have? In B2B marketing, we know that sales cycles are often long and, and they can range anywhere from you know six months to even three years, depending on the size of the, the contract value, um, who you're selling to. You know, For instance, if it's government, um, it could be a very, very, very long sales cycle. Um, so there might be a lot of meetings with sales involved. So, so just getting that, that lead coming in, that form fill, that's not the end of, of the journey. That's in, in many instances, really just kind of the start of the journey. And then of course, you know, what we're really all here to talk about is ABM. And ABM is that highly targeted approach to a group of accounts. Um, and Chris kind of covered that, I think in pretty good detail. We've got one to many, which is a larger group of accounts, one to few, which is, you know, um, smaller slices of accounts, and then getting into one to one. But the goal of ABM is to be much more targeted than the other two uh, types of, of B2B marketing. So next slide, Chris. So this is our, our ABM maturity model that, that we have created. I know there's some other uh, maturity models out there, um, Isma and Forrester. I'm not very familiar with those. And so I, I can't say how much overlap there is between what we've come up with and, and what these other organizations have put out there. Um, this is intended to be modular. So what I mean by that is, is that this doesn't necessarily have to follow a specific order, especially in early stage, because we speak with clients all the time that, you know, they've been running pilot campaigns. They, they have solved their creative and technical capacity issues. They have meaningful sales and marketing alignment. They probably already have an ABM orchestration platform like a demand base with Sixth Sense, and they might even have executive sponsorship. This maturity model is really created based on our experience in working with a lot of different organizations and meeting them where they are in their individual ABM journey. And so, you know, to go back to the, the quote in the beginning, uh, goal without a plan is just a wish. This is, the model that we've created to help to, to really flesh out that roadmap. Um, determine what your desired end state is, and that would be the late stage groups. Um, so full tech stack integration, full funnel nurture engine, ABM on demand, um, and then fully functional ABM COE or center of excellence, which is something we're hearing a lot of organizations moving towards um, in 2024. So really understanding where you wanna to get to, and then digging in to figure out what are the steps that are gonna be necessary to get there. And it might be a one, two, or even three year journey, really just depending. There's a lot of variables in terms of overcoming these or, or meeting these, um, these benchmarks to be able to, to get to a place of sophistication. And you know, some of these um, milestones are, are independent and some of them are entirely dependent. So for instance, pilot programs, dedicated ABM campaigns, and then ABM on demand, as well as full funnel nurture engine. 
these are all very dependent upon each other. And so it's kind of like that crawl, walk, run that we talk about all the time in terms of how do you go from early stage, not super sophisticated to late stage, which is your, you know, an ABM hero, essentially. All right. Great, so what ABM destination is right for you? So it's really imperative in ABM programs that you define what you're working towards. Um, and that's really where we see success is defining what you're working towards and creating that plan. So Vincent's gonna talk a little bit about that. So one of the, the first destinations in the late stage maturity model is a full tech stack integration. And, and so we have it kind of related to peanut butter and jelly. Um, and, and so a lot of folks already have a tech stack. Most people do to a degree. Um, it might be, you know, an integration with your uh, marketing automation and your CRM. Um, your analytics is probably tied in there. Your data visualization um, might be tied in there. When we talk about full tech stack integration, really what we're talking about is the ability to automate a lot of the stuff that will happen within your tech stack. So for instance, you've got your ABM orchestration platform, um, again, a demand base or a sixth sense. You've got your content experience platform, which would be something like a path factory or a Hushly. Um, obviously CRM marketing automation, your sales enablement platform, like a sales loft, um, your DAM, your digital asset management, and then your analytics. And, and a lot of folks have additional pieces tied into their tech stack. And so getting to a place of having all of these tools fully integrated so that they're passing information back and forth to each other in a bi-directional capacity. So they're sharing information essentially. And that gives you the ability to control where accounts are within different stages of the funnel based on your account scoring process. So, you know, having the ability to score your accounts is one thing, being able to move accounts to different stages manually within your ABM orchestration platform is another thing. Getting to a place where you've got all of these tools, these pieces fully integrated, sharing data back and forth, and then automating as much of this process as possible is really, that's the goal of this, um, this individual step within the maturity model. So let's go on to the next one, Chris. So this is that full funnel nurture engine, and this relates back to, you know, when we look at um, demand gen, lead gen, and ABM as somewhat se separate or siloed entities, um, and, and changing that to a much more integrated full funnel approach to running demand gen, running lead gen, and running ABM that are actually complementing each other. So think of it from the perspective of an MQL is essentially maybe someone who attended a webinar like we're doing today, or they downloaded a case study or a white paper. They're not ready for sales outreach at that moment in time. Um, they need further nurture. They might be at the very beginning stage of a of a what might be a very long journey to to even begin to talk to sales. Um, you know, flip over to lead gen, and you've got people who are requesting meetings with sales, but that again can still be pretty early stages. They might not even be the decision makers or even the stakeholders within that buying community. They could be the people who are um, tasked with gathering the information. So again, they're not you know that's not revenue yet. It's not even an opportunity at that point in time. And then of course we have ABM. And so these three tactics fitting together, really that's, that's where you can supercharge your, your full funnel approach. So that when uh, an MQL gets created from demand gen, we know that there is a specific journey that they follow and they fall into the funnel. And so as they score up, we begin to see they're able to move through the funnel on their own. And so that means you know, are we seeing additional people from that organization downloading assets? Um, are they coming back, you know, multiple times? And these are kind of triggers that give us some insight into, yes, they're ready to move into that next uh, stage within the full funnel. Same thing goes with lead gen. You know, they come in, they've had a meeting with sales, what happens then? Um, these things should all be integrated um, to be really successful at ABM. These things should all be integrated um, with a, a perspective of they, it's all account-based. And so we wanna make sure that at this stage, 
we are fully integrating demand gen, lead gen, and ABM into the into the full process. So you know, as these um, independent uh, things happen, they are really part of a, a much much bigger picture, which leads to you know much uh, quicker velocity. Um, you know, we're we're going to see higher contract values. We have more control of our pipeline. It's much easier and, and more reliable to predict what the outcome of that pipeline is going to be, et cetera. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, Chris. Um, hey, Vincent, Daniel Jones um, on our webinar has just asked, do you consider um, the, the couple of tools we've talked about and those vendors, do we consider those best in breed? From my perspective, yeah, this is my opinion. Um, I, I definitely, have a lot of experience with demand base, Sixth Sense, Path Factory, and Hushly. Um, I've got also some experience with other tools like Terminus, Triblio, um, Follows, Uberflip. But the ones that, when we look at the capacity to be able to get to a, a destination of sophistication in terms of maturity related to ABM, these are the tools that, that we push for, for our clients to use. Now, from the agency perspective, we're agnostic. And so if we work with a client and they have tools other than, you know, what I've listed, we can absolutely plug in and work with those as well. But if someone asks me what my opinion is and my experience, those are generally speaking my recommendations. Thanks, Dan. So what does this all feed into? Where does it all go at the end? Um, the a term that's being thrown around a lot is an um, an ABM COE or a center of excellence, and it is really a resource hub designed to help your organization team develop impactful ABM campaigns because everything becomes centralized there. Um, all of the strategies live there that you created. All of the reporting lives there. All of that beautiful research that goes into an ABM campaign should be living in your COE so that we can redo it again and again and again. That's something that I get really passionate about is that ABM should feel scalable. It shouldn't feel like a, a dredge through things like, oh no, we got to get that ABM campaign up again. You wouldn't have to do that if you're keeping all, a hold of all of those things so that you can do it again, creating playbooks, which we'll talk about more. All of those beautiful pieces go back into your COE so that you can do it again, and it makes it easier and easier for the team. Also, when you start to see how all of those lovely tech stack pieces Vincent talked about, all of that goes back into the COE as well, and there is how to use it, what's the process. All of those things live here, and it really is helpful. Some of the things that go into a COE, COE, just so you kind of like quick look at it, is you're going to have some self-serve campaign playbooks, which I think is great. Um, you can have them set for sales. There can be some for marketing or even executives um, so that everybody can look at the campaign and just see what they need to see, the importance for them. Sales cares about really specific things in marketing and um, ex and your um, your 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 uh, your big groups. <laughs> Everybody ha cares about something different with playbooks. And so we're going to keep those there. Templatized ABM, call scripts can be in there, your educational tools, content tools, and any historical data and reporting is great. Even some information about those contacts can be in there um, as you go so that you can keep historical knowledge. Yes, that's in your CRM, but sometimes that doesn't always get updated quite as well as we'd like. So make sure that that information is also available in your ABM COE. Sarah, to you. Okay, so we just covered a lot. Um, we threw a lot of information at you, but we're gonna really talk about ABM pilots. So really, where do you start on this journey and how do you get there? Next slide, Chris. So where do we begin? Um, ABM must start with defining your goals and objectives, which we talked about a little bit, but what are those common objectives and goals? So we look at it, um, we kind of broken it down by no means is this all of them, but these are some of the more common ones that we see. So whether it be opening doors, strong leads for sales, um, overcoming a negative perspective. So that could be maybe pricing, if you've had implementation struggles within an account, if you have a really complicated or complex product that maybe um, your customer base isn't fully grasping or understanding, um, that's a really great place to start. Uh, we like to educate or re-educate on offerings. 
uh, break into new verticals. You know, everyone always wants to break into a new vertical. How do you do it? ABM's great for that with tailored messaging. Uh, closing business. So this is really more of that one-to-one -one that we're talking about. Um, so if there's an account you really want to close and we want to give them that high-touch white club experience, that's a great um, tactic. Grow existing accounts. This is a big one. So maybe you have sold in to a portion of the account and maybe it's a larger global account and we want to sell through that uh, full account. And then expand relationships. We know, you know, sales uh, can be really lengthy. So we might have relationships with some of those decision makers or some of those influencers, but we really want to make sure that we're targeting the whole buying committee. Um, and then uh, really strengthen those relationships. So making sure we're expanding the relationships and strengthening the relationships that we have. <laughs> so choosing your pilot program by digging in a little further. ABM pilots are really here to help determine internal best practices around ABM campaign components. We've really broken this down from one to many pilots, one to few pilots, the one to one pilots. So in a one-to-many pilot, uh, the average number of accounts you're really looking at here is 50 to 100. Uh, we're going to use a broad audience segment. The goal is always going to be awareness. You know, this is kind of a broader uh, group of accounts. Uh, the messaging type is high level. Uh, we'll probably tailor it to persona so that you're still getting some of that customized messaging. It's not, you know, the traditional marketing where you're just kind of one message going out to everyone. The campaign elements would really be digital media, programmatic, social, um, and we're really looking for touch points and engagement at this stage. So an example of a one-to-many would be uh, a campaign to accounts in manufacturing. So we're grouping all those manufacturing accounts, we're maybe breaking up three personas within those accounts, and we're tailoring some messaging uh, to those accounts, and we have around 50 to 100. Uh, we get a little more uh, granular in our one to few pilots. So we're looking at 10 to 25 accounts. And this is really going to allow us to segment accounts by industry, region, product, ranking. It could even be how we talked about on the last slide, a perception. If we know that certain uh, accounts have one perception, we can use that tactic. Uh, our messaging type is really tailoring messaging, addressing the segment imperative and initiative. So what are those pain points? What's driving those accounts? What are they trying to solve for? Um, and how do we tailor our solution to those pain points to solve it and really present it on a silver platter for them? We're using full email nurture uh, in this uh, stage, targeted digital media and social. And then our success measurement, measurement is sales increase and marketing qualified leads. And an example is targeted campaigns to manufacturing accounts who are price sensitive in the US. So as you see in the one to many, we have manufacturing accounts. We've now gotten more granular into the segmentation strategy in the one to few to target those manufacturing accounts who are price sensitive in one region. And then we have our one to one pilot. So average number of accounts is one. At times we see maybe one to two, you know, if they're very similar type of thing. Uh, we have a target account that matches ICP. Our goal is to close uh, or grow and win business. The messaging type is hyper-targeted and personalized for name accounts. This is where we're going to name the account in our messaging. This is where we're going to talk directly to that account. We're going to use their language. We're going to use their colors. We're going to use everything to make it sound like we are in that account. We've penetrated that account and we're speaking directly to that account. The campaign elements is individualized messaging and content experiences tailored to the personas. So if we know that uh, it's price sensitivity, uh, we might create a really high level value report that talks about the savings that that exact account would get by partnering or um, being a customer with us. And the, the success measurement is pipeline influence and deal progression. And an example of this would be growing one manufacturing account. So really targeting in on that one manufacturing account, honing in on those pain points and really creating highly customized messaging. So pilot programs, they don't stay pilot programs forever. Um, they, they really are meant to be repeatable, scalable, and customizable. Chris touched on that a bit. So we really have kind of a circular example here. So we have our pilot programs. We're going to customize those programs. We're going to gather all of our learnings. What did we learn? What worked? What didn't work? Um, and then we're going to optimize and create a playbook. We're going to go into playbooks a little later. You'll see all the great stuff that goes into playbooks. Um, and then we'll align on KPIs. 
and then choose target accounts. And we will go through this process many times and we will keep going with those learnings. You're talking, but you're muted, Chris. Of course, I'm going to be the one to talk on mute. My goodness. Okay. Where do you think the breakpoint is between one to few and met one to many in terms of accounts per cohort? You list the averages. Do you think there are any absolutes or best practices for guiding, um, guiding to? I can take this one if you want, or Sarah. Sure. I mean, jump in. Um, I think that there, it really comes down to scalability and what your account can handle, your, your um, company can handle. Do you have enough people to help you guide a pilot program of 25 um, in a one to few? I like to err on the side of um, really, if it's up to me, a group of 15 feels great. Like that's my favorite, right? But if some of the accounts are so similar, going up to 25 is fine as long as it's a really good segment. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be, it's not really a numbers game. It's more about how strong is your segment strategy? Are these companies aligned enough to make sure that if I'm sending out content, it still feels customized and specialized for them. So it's more about that big plan that we talked about and how you can ultimately get to the end and really give them all a good customized ABM campaign um, rather than necessarily amount of accounts. I rarely see them go well after 25 accounts. You just get too many cooks in the kitchen past that number. Um, lots of sales folks have a lot of strong ideas past that, and it's just harder to manage. Now, those one to many, I put one to 100. I just feel like, again, it's a little bit easier to manage. But if your product really fits a even larger group and you're just simply going out to an industry, that can be larger. Sometimes I've seen pretty well done demand gen programs out to even thousands. But again, is it manageable for your team? And are you going to really um, make sure that your team is following up on those leads as they come in? So it's all about manageability rather than um, how many accounts can I fit in there? So I, I hope that also, answers your question. I'll also add one other portion to this, actually. It also depends on how your accounts are split up in your organization. How many sales reps are you working with and who owns those accounts? You know, if you're looking at it's five sales reps, maybe that's a little more manageable. But if you're working with 25 sales reps, that becomes very um, complicated quickly for your team. So we really want to make sure we understand who owns those accounts, who's involved in this, and is there that sales buy-in that makes sense for each of these segments? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, scalable ABM. So Chris, this is this is your baby. Oh, yeah, it is. It's scalable a, now that we've talked about ABM pilot, let's dive into how we make it it scalable, which actually is a great uh kind of com like we just were talking about it by talking about how many accounts you can have in each of those um, ABM programs. How do we keep it scalable? Um, yes, every account, we want them to feel customized and personalized. Absolutely. That's the, our goal. But ultimately, they all have similar problems, similar pain points, because that's why your product is interesting to them and why it fits their needs. So you should be doing things like develop, developing like a template and everything you create, even if it feels very customized for one to count, one account should still be put into some sort of template and you should kind of think about it in puzzle pieces. That's how I always put it together is that some of the pieces are customized just for the account and some of the pieces are just a broad conversation that you would have about your product or your solution. 
Um, that doesn't mean that we can't tailor each piece along the way, but that just keeps it scalable and interesting to your account that you're um, campaigning to. And this is at a one-to-one -one or a one-to-few or a one-to-many scale, honestly. And making sure, again, all of those pieces are being put in that lovely little COE at the end, that's going to make it so it's easy for everybody on your team to find them again and use them again. Not to mention, you can also, as things move along and you start doing your ABN journey, um, you can start using a lot of marketing technology and AI to automate some of those customizations to further scale your efforts. I think that's really important. Everybody's talking about AI right now. It's here to be a tool to be helpful. Um, I wouldn't use it for everything. I wouldn't use it absolutely everywhere. And you have to definitely check on some of the information, but it can be a tool that is worthwhile to help keep your, your campaign scalable. Um, again, here's, here's that scalability, build that center of excellence so that all of these things can be reused over and over and over again. Um, make sure to keep track, by the way, of those accounts that do get some of that campaign material because you don't wanna send it to them again. That is, that's probably just one of those little oopsies that happen sometimes, but keep track of that. Um, here's a really good example of how some of the creativity can be, um, be scaled quickly. And I think that we like to show this because it's like a quick, quick um, little, like it's a two pager that we've sent to a client. In each situation, you can see they ultimately look the same, but we wanted to send them out to specific industries and we wanted to still make it feel specific to the account we were going after. So in the first batch, it's out our agriculture and this is a shipping business. So the ships look different in each of these industries and it's very specific to them. Construction has one need, shipping, obviously we need to show all of those shipping containers. And in agriculture, we need to fill it with wheat even the first paragraph of each and the um and the title of each of these pieces changes because all of these groups have different pain points but ultimately if i turned it around let me just tell you the rest of the paper's the same it's all the same use case it's all there it just matches up to them we just made them feel like this was customized for them it's ready for them and we took the time to think about their needs the other thing this doesn't show is that on the back side there's contact information for their specific sales rep as well. So just some things to keep track of, but you can see how this can be done at scale very easily. Um, and again, keep it in that COE to pull out and use again. This is another way that we kind of do, and these are just a couple of examples to just get the wheels churning for y'all. Landing page personalization always great we always like to see it now that we have things like path factories hustlies follows of the world that is really helpful and makes it way easier to do what you ultimately want to do is have a really nice wireframe that's going to speak to a persona at a time i actually like to put it at the persona level not necessarily account level unless i'm doing a very specific one-to-one -one. but that way i can have a landing page and quickly have it um, dynamically pull in a logo for the contact that's coming to it. Um, and what you don't see here is there was three versions of this landing page and the person on the front changed depending on the persona. So here we had more of an executive look, but we also needed to talk to a lot of IT folks and we felt like probably the suit and tie wasn't exactly the right look for them. So the image for them was actually some guys in jeans and t-shirts looking around with you know big headphones right? It gives the feeling that we made it for them. The other thing is the global collaboration, that's important to the ex executive, but wasn't exactly important for the IT folks. So there was three versions. All of them still have that lovely dynamic logo. Um, and then below counter opposition to what we're trying to talk about, we want to make sure right away that we're building the evidence for whatever this landing page is and what we're trying their pain point trying to talk to them. This may change depending on the persona. It even may change by the account that's coming to the page. Um, and we can make sure that all of those things are dynamic. Um, I always like to make sure that there's assets on there, content. I constantly am telling people that you can't send anything out without some content. We all have a like library of beautiful content. Let's make sure people are looking at it. So put it on those landing pages um, and change it often. The problem most people have with these landing pages is that they just make it one day for their ABM campaign and then they don't touch it again. 
have a plan and a regular calendar update to go in and change out those assets so that you're already prepared. And by changing out those assets, you're actually showing a larger group of your of folks coming in and out of your landing page. It also makes it so that the reporting stays strong um, because you're constantly having them come back to the landing page and they're seeing the fresh, that it's constantly fresh. I even sometimes love to change out even the image at the top to just make it still feel fresh over time. Um, one of those other things that you should absolutely make sure is in there is some sort of case st study or testimonial that speaks to their industry or their pain point directly. Um, nothing works better than a case study. Um, we all know that. And sometimes it's hard to get somebody to get a case study white label it too. Um, white labeled case studies work just as well. Sometimes it's even nice to put something that maybe it's not on your main website and it feels like it may, we made this just for them. So again, anytime we can customize further and further, great. And then at the bottom, I love to make sure that the sales reps are are on a page and it has their picture. Um, I know not all sales folks are like thrilled to use their photo, but it really helps. It makes people like, oh, hey, Joe looks looks like a guy I, I went to high school with. I need to need to get reach out to him. It's there. It makes gives them a personality um, instead of just that cold call. It's there. They can reach out. I also make sure that the LinkedIn is on there. Um, I also make sure that the sales reps LinkedIn photo matches with the here. So they absolutely know, oh, they go together, they're the same person, right? Um, all of those things need to come together and that sort of gives that big picture. Anyways, those are some landing page little tips and tricks to think about for scaling. Hey, Chris, can I clarify one thing real quick before sure. we move on? So, Easy. yeah, so related to uh, Path Factory and Hushly, for instance. So those are tools that will actually um, put in like the next logical, a uh, group of um, assets, content assets. So they will identify, you know, when this person comes back, they've already seen these assets. Assuming you have a, a decent library of assets, it will serve up the next logical assets upon their return, as well as it will dynamically swap out the sales rep by account when it's tied to your CRM. So this is just some of the ways that like when Chris talks about it, it's, he's absolutely lived that, that doing it manual process. Some of these tools are great when they're all tied together because they do a lot of that heavy lifting stuff for you. So you don't even have to worry about it and, and it just automatically gets done. So thanks, Chris. Thank you. I'm still a little old school, you know. So, <laughs> um, so how does it all come together? Because it is a lot to orchestrate, right? Um, campaigns have many moving parts. A little bit later, we'll talk about how sales comes into play as well. But when it all comes together, it's really important to have strong orchestration. Um, if you have a project manager on your side, even better. Um, that's what you need, right? Everything needs to be listed out. What's happening when it's happening? Here are our you know, digital advertising, website personalization. When does it need to be updated? When is the marketing emails go out? When is direct mail going out? When does the SDR need to get on the horn and actually call somebody and follow up? We want to make sure that it's all here. This is just a small breath of the different like kind of channels we could take. Um, but you can see it's really aligned on the sixth day. SDR is going to email and then they need to make the phone call the same day. And then they're going to send a follow up that very following day and they're going to do a LinkedIn message. We want to make sure it's so clear that everyone knows what they're doing at any time. I think of it as a perfect recipe, right? We go through strategy, we get it all together. This is where the recipe really comes to live, alive and we put all of the items to the side and now we start putting the measurements next to it, right? That's what we need to accomplish. And this is gonna make your program way smoother in the long run. Um, again, this is just a little sample because I've seen these things just get massive because we're going after so many channels. Um, this also should just be per campaign. Um, I wouldn't get too carried away with trying to overlap a bunch of campaigns, make it keep things simple for people. Um, let's move on. Great. So how do we measure everything? We know that measurement is key in any marketing program, but especially if you're running ABM pilot programs, you need to show that measurement and how do we do it? Oh, 
<laughs> Thanks, Chris. So here at ABMA, we are big fans of a lot of KPIs. Um, I, I feel like these speak in particular to the marketing partners that we work with. What we're trying to do is to, to have that element of repeatability as we move forward. And so these are pre-launch KPIs that we'll be creating benchmarks for to be able to know how long does it take us to do X, Y, or Z related to launching a campaign. So there's you know a full content assessment and matrix creation, uh, your internal approval process and SLA alignment, roles and responsibilities clearly defined across you know, marketing, creative, sales, SDR, et cetera. Um, you're, you know, obviously, you're building out your, your contact list for the buying committee, decision makers, and stakeholders. You're validating uh, accounts and segments, which we talked about when you're looking at one to few or even one to one. Um, your roadmap for communications, you need to have that clearly defined. How are we going to communicate? How often? What are we going to communicate? Um, you know, the full GTM strategy has been created. And then this is my own kind of personal uh, pet project, which is how long does it take to actually get these pieces set up? So having that benchmark around how long does it take my team to create a microsite? How long does it take to create uh, an individual asset? How long does it take to create email to support the nurtures? And so these are all very important pieces as you begin to move towards scaling your ability to do uh, more and, and better ABM, you're going to have to know how long does it take to go from zero to six, exactly, you know, and say, okay, it took us eight weeks the second time, we're gonna target trying to do it in seven weeks the next time or six weeks the, the following time. And so why is this important? We've seen that if you're, if you're delayed between your strategy slash GTM and then getting live with your campaigns, those strategies start to become irrelevant. Your business changes, the way you go to market changes, the way you sell changes, your competitors might change things. And so if you take too long to go from, we've created our strategy to now we're going live with our campaigns, you run the risk of becoming irrelevant. And so that's the last thing in the world we wanna do, obviously, right? As marketers, we don't wanna put in a ton of time and effort, other people's time and effort, and then find out at the end of it that we, we may have missed our window of opportunity. Next slide, please. And so here's where we get into some of the more, you know, we're, we're running the campaign. Um, it's the first three weeks, um, midterm of the campaign. So we're into, you know, month two or three, and then long-term, if it's a six month to nine month campaign, what does the output look like? And these are what I would consider to be some more traditional KPIs. Um, most of these, I think, we're all familiar with. This is really just a sampling, and this isn't to say these are the only KPIs that we recommend. We do full workshops on this with our, our uh, clients to really dig into what do we need to analyze, what do we need to create KPIs around in order to be able to define, you, you have to know what success looks like. You have to know, you know, how do we define winning with these campaigns? And there might be four or five um, KPIs related to that specifically. You have to know where do we course correct in the midterm stage. So we're running these campaigns and maybe we're comparing these metrics to previous pilots and we're seeing that, you know, some of our metrics are a little bit lower than we're, we're accustomed to where they should be. And so we have the opportunity to course correct there. And, you know, the, the early stage ones are kind of the, the big ones. Like, are we getting off on the right foot? Are we moving in the right direction? Do we need to make some adjustments? Did we pick the right accounts? Um, are we, you know, are we sure that our messaging is resonating with the personas we're targeting, et cetera? So, so this is kind of a sampling, but you know, you you can't really determine if you're being successful without good, strong KPIs. And and my personal opinion is, if the only KPIs you have are related to the output of your campaign, you run the risk of failing. And it's definitely not repeatable because I, I think, you know, the, the thing that Chris has said over and over again and Sarah as well is that we don't want to just run these campaigns ad hoc, one and done. We want to make sure that we're putting ourselves in a position to leverage all this work to do it again and spend less time and be more efficient and, you know, have more velocity in, in terms of getting the campaigns up and running. Also, you know, the, the key is to make sure that they are increasingly more successful. 
we're optimizing campaigns, we are reviewing you know asset performance to see where maybe we should insert a different asset at a different touch point, et cetera. So there's a lot we could talk about. KPI is a great opportunity to do a workshop to really get some awesome information out of that. Next slide, please. Great. So sales and marketing harmony. How do we bring the teams together? We know a lot of organizations struggle with this. It's kind of, you know, sales and marketing are always pinned against each other. And for a successful ABM program, we want to align. So Chris is going to talk a little bit about how we do that. Okay. Everybody plays a part. We all want to have a successful ABM program, but that really relies on seamless collaboration. Um, marketing can't do it all. Um, and we all need to get along and play at the, play the same game together, ultimately. Um, and that's been hard for marketing companies. Like it, that, that's, that's just how it goes. And, you know, sales has always had one idea of how things are going to go and marketing has a different, the KPIs don't always match up, um, all of that. What we're saying with a successful ABM program, we all come together and we play the same game so that we have the same outcomes, okay? We all wanna to win together. Um, marketing is gonna handle a lot of the orchestration, honestly. Um, you're going to be kind of setting it all up, making sure the campaigns are there, doing that research, getting all the pieces in, lo in line so that the campaign can actually happen. Um, your sales is gonna be doing targeted outreach. They're gonna be making the phone calls. They are going to be right there in the front lines doing the the like he, kind of the heavy lifting in a way i'm going to just say it um but that's great because they're also should be gathering all of that great customer intelligence along the way that's going to make marketing's jobs easier to to be putting out worthwhile campaigns um obviously customer success your um your ams they should be um getting great calculated data from customers as they're coming in or even as they're leaving frankly we want to know the good the bad the ugly when you're creating an abm program so everything should come together so that we can put together a really clean um uh, campaign um creative of course is going to be building all those tools for us we love a good creative um and it can be it can be daunting when they have to make a template um that then they have to customize for up to you know 25 accounts that can feel daunting. That's why we try to keep those customizations scalable, okay? And then again, um, product all the way around to the product and group and solutions, the, the intelligence we get from them, they should be starting to align the product with all of the great information that we are hearing from sales, from marketing, on how people are coming to the, to the site. What's the intent data? What's, what is the thing about your product or solution that's like, turning heads, we need to give that to products so they can make sure that that is the thing that we are pushing out the most, right? Um, all of it comes together to have the most seamless, um, successful ABM program. Now, here's the real, this is always the tricky one, right? Marketing and sales together, ABM dynamite. I love that, right? Um, with enhanced alignment, everything's gonna, like you're gonna have that, what is it? Marketing becomes synchronized revenue engine optimized for the full buyer journey. Excellent. We want in the long run, everybody, we want bigger celebrations and joint wins at the end. Um, there's a list here of shared benefits. I'm not going to go through them all. You all can read them. Um, but I'm going to highlight a couple of them that I just really love and um, things that really you need to think about right at the beginning. The ultimate goal here and benefit of the alignment for me is to make sure that marketing and sales incentives are matched and that the KPIs are aligned. Um, Everybody needs to be working towards the same goal in the long run. Um, for years, a lot of marketing just relies on, oh, well, the click-through rate was great and the impressions were good. And I've, there were some MQLs, but what happened to those MQLs afterwards, right? Sales is there too, then they need to be doing the follow-up. So it's a better place to look at like how many meetings were made? What was the engagement? Who actually was talking to them and what did they say? What was the things that we got from that call? Those are the things that we need to be keeping track of. Um, 
obviously if marketing sales together you're going to have easier process and handoffs everybody should know their part and what they're doing so if i'm writing an email as a marketer i need to make sure sales knows exactly when they're going to send it what is the follow-up conversation they're going to have? I need to prepare them with all the tools so that they're ready. Um, I'm arming them with all the best stuff, right? Because in the end, again, our goals align and I want to have a bigger celebration at the end because we're all excited. Um, the other pieces that I just think are kind of like awesome is that your assets and campaigns are going to be more relevant for sales and marketing sales often says great that piece of content was awesome but i couldn't send it to anybody because it didn't it didn't fit um well here's a moment where sales actually gets a say and says these are the piece of content that i think would hit the most with these customers and marketing says great let's make them so these is this is where that alignment comes together and you're going to see much stronger abm campaigns the flow is going to go well you saw that orchestration piece earlier that is set to make sure that everybody knows what they're doing oh that's it great so we've talked a lot about you know the early stages of the abm maturity model so we're going to dive in and go um at a high level into the mid stage so what goes into it so Chris just did a great job talking about sales and marketing alignment, but what we haven't talked about yet is executive sponsorship. So really it's so important for your ABM programs to have an executive champion or sponsor uh, within your organization for it to be successful. Um, and that's how we really achieve uh, ABM excellence. So, you know, it's going to be your CMO, your CFO, your CRO, the CEOs, any of the C-suite, really. Um, it can be different for every organization. If you're a larger organization, it can be a VP. Um, but we really want to go, who is the highest person in command we can get to really champion this program internally and make sure that we're driving it forward? So they would act as the internal ABM uh, evangelist. Uh, they would uh, do reviews and validate the return on investment. So what's that ROI? You know, why are we spending this money? A lot of times people are doing ABM as a new initiative. So making sure we're seeing that return and the executives understand that return of that investment. Uh, instills financial rigor, rigor into ABM activities. We don't want to go wild here, but um, you know, what's an appropriate spend? lends credibility to long-term roadmap. So, you know, as we talked about, there's a long roadmap to get to that COE. So we really need someone to help us get those team members, you know, excited, the appropriate team members involved, uh, making sure that it's all uh, lined out for that roadmap to be successful. Uh, we need that CEO, CEO, CFO perspective. You know, we really want to make sure they understand the program. We're taking in uh, their goals and their, you know, what are they driving the business to and how does our ABM program align to their goals? And then holding business units accountable. We can always try, but sometimes you just kind of need that iron fist to go in and just say, this is what we're doing and this is the direction we're going, especially if it's new to your organization. There's a piece of change management that has to happen. Not everyone loves change, so we kind of need someone to be the tough guy. Um, drives adoption by mandating uh, participation, just kind of what I was talking about. Secures required budget and headcount support. That's a big one. ABM can be expensive. And so, you know, outside of validating our what type of ABM we're doing and the return on investment, we really need to make sure that the budget is there to run these programs. There's nothing worse than, you know, putting in all this effort for a one to one program only to realize you don't have the budget to support it. Um, provides air cover and then generates buy-in across the organization. So really making sure if this is a full new adoption that we have the organization aligned to it and that there's that buy-in, you know, with all the different team members that are going to be touching this program. Next slide. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. That was that was terrific. And I know you you think about executive sponsorship and it 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 is a daunting task. It's not an easy thing to get that buy-in because it is it is change. And and you know if you're truly intent on getting to an ABM COE, it's going to be significant change for the organization, not just for marketing. It's going to be change for revenue, for sales, for marketing, customer success, everybody, quite literally, to get to this place of you know 
what we would call the holy grail for ABM. But again, you know, we do workshops on every one of these stages to really help to prepare our our clients for what do they have to do in order to achieve and overcome these milestones. So good good stuff, Sarah. Um, this is a an example of a milestone that doesn't necessarily have to come in at this point in time. It, it in fact, for many of you, it might already be in place. Um, you you may already be past pilot campaigns, and you yeah you, know, you may already have a lot of this stuff integrated. And you may already be using a demand base or a sixth sense, and um, that's great. That's in in my opinion, that's absolutely fantastic because they give you the ability to do a lot of automation, and so it reduces the you know kind of the manual um, components of ABM, not just like it isn't an easy button. I, I always say that to folks. An ABM orchestration platform isn't an easy button. It's an easier button, and it definitely automates and and takes the data and applies it to your your you know your accounts, how you how you have them segmented, helping you to create journeys or move accounts into kind of the next stage um, in terms of your journeys. And it can be your control panel. It's kind of that you know this is the place where. I get to see the data from all my different pieces of tech kind of come to life and how they all get shared. So we won't spend a ton of time on the AVM orchestration platform piece. Everybody's familiar, I think, probably most of the folks on this call, I'd be very surprised if everyone wasn't familiar with the major platforms that are out there. They definitely play their, their part. As you increase your maturity, they become much more important. So if you if you're if you're looking to get to a more mature place and you don't have one of these platforms, it will be important to kind of figure out where does it fit in in your timeline and how do you end up um, integrating it. All right, playbooks. So you heard us mention playbooks quite a bit during this uh, webinar. So what are they? Uh, they're the ultimate ABM coach. So they provide practical advice, frameworks, tools, and templates, really enabling sales, marketing, and even leadership teams to execute successful ABM journeys. Here at ABMA, when we do um, when we do campaigns, we create playbooks for each team. Uh, each team is going to care about different portions of the campaign, so we want to make sure our playbooks are tailored to exactly what they need. You know, sales isn't always going to want to see all the information that marketing is going to need to execute these campaigns. Leadership is not going to want to see every single sales email that's going out, but they really want to see what are what are we measuring? What are the high level tactics here? So making sure that we're tailoring those playbooks to exactly what those team members care about. Um, our playbooks will include results and outcomes from the pilot program. So, you know, what what did we do in the pilot program? What were the results? What were the outcomes? Uh, guidance for sales and marketing to align. So really making sure that sales is supported, you know, with the call scripts, the emails, the ad sets, everything, but then also who is responsible for what? What are those roles and responsibilities? And what does that split look like? How to choose the correct account or set of accounts. So making sure that we're really defining that account segmentation strategy. Uh, high level messaging. So within that segmentation strategy, what is our messaging and how does it enhance or update depending on the accounts chosen? We have channel strategy. Of course, what channels are we using in this program? Campaign plans that include instructions on how to use them, the campaign framework, integrated flight plans, and campaign flows. So at a holistic level, what does that campaign look like? And what are all the steps of that campaign? Sales materials, which I touched upon. So those call, strip, call scripts, objection handling, uh, really help them align to those campaign plans. And then links to creative folders. So where can they find all those creative assets? Where can they find the ads that their customers are seeing? Making sure that it's clickable, it's one button away, and nobody is left in the dark or guessing what is being uh, given to customers within this program and then defined roles and responsibilities. So exactly which department is responsible for what and what is that baton handoff? You know, a lot of times we'll see those roles and responsibilities defined, but we don't really see where that trigger happens of, okay, well, now it's your turn. So really defining that clearly for the teams. So unlocking team success, how everyone benefits from ABM playbooks. So we kind of just have a highlight of each team and how they benefit from these playbooks. So marketing, uh, it provides a structured approach to effectively target key accounts, 
offer detailed strategies, tactics, and metrics for personalized marketing. Um, and then they're aligned to the business goals and then leads to stronger, efficient resource utilization. Sales is really getting aligned sales strategies with marketing efforts. So really going back to that sales and marketing alignment that Chris was talking about, uh, providing clear guidelines and insights for personalized engagement and enhancing sales effectiveness. You know, sales, they are going to have a clear view of how they want to do things, and that's great. And they might know that account, but it has to align back to our marketing program. So how do we give them that information? And then it leads to better leads, so stronger relationships and, and increased sales conversions. And then leadership uh, aligns marketing and sales efforts uh, with company strategy goals, ensuring efficient resource allo allo uh, allocation, enables tracking and measurable outcomes for high level customers, relationships and ROI, and then supports sustainable growth and competitive advantage through strategic focus. So giving leadership really that high level information they need so that they can do their job. That was that was terrific. And and I would say again, this is that's one of those stages that doesn't need to be further back. It certainly can be earlier on. And I think it kind of comes down to, you know, as you're doing your pilot campaigns, you can start to become familiar with what should your playbooks look like. They don't have to be all encompassing necessarily at first. And this to me, it's one of those like something's better than nothing kind of scenarios. Like you do need to be able to show people what their lanes are, what their roles and responsibilities are, what the messaging looks like. And so getting getting playbooks together for your pilots, great idea. But the reality is, is not all marketing departments are, are set up to do that. And so sometimes it just has to come a little bit further back. Again, it really just depends on your resources. Um, so moving into the next stage, dedicated ABM campaigns. This is what I would call the walk to ABM pilot crawl. Right. This is where you're you're not quite operationalizing ABM. You're still doing a lot of stuff manually, but you are now at that stage where you can do these things repeatedly. And you've got, you know, you've got your templates, um, you've got material you've you've been using, you have um, your benchmark KPIs so you know what good looks like and what great looks like. And so you now have the ability to you know, let's say you did one year, let's say last year you did three one to few or five one to few and three one to ones. And then the following year you take your learnings and now you're doing, you know, 10, 15 one to ones and you're doing, you know, double or, or maybe even more one to few campaigns. You, you haven't quite gotten to that. We're fully integrating our tech stack. We don't have full automation yet but you are taking what you've learned from pilots and you're improving upon that and you're putting that into, as Chris said, they, pilots don't stay pilots forever. You're now putting it into practice. You're continuing to learn from the activities, but now you're actually running ABM in what I would call is a more meaningful way, a more purposeful way. The organization is starting to see much more benefit, right? You're, you're now able to start to look at pipeline and revenue and say, see, look, this is why we should be doing more of this. And here's where you can take that and go to leadership and say, here's why we need, you know, X number of dollars next year to be able to try and move to a COE, et cetera. So, so this is a real critical stage. I suspect that this is possibly where a number of you are, are really located right now, where you're trying to figure out how do I move from, I'm doing one to few and one to one to I'm doing it more frequently, more more repeatedly with more repeatability and more success. Okay, so how do we get to that ABM excellence? We've talked about the early stages, the mid stages, but how do we get to, you know, that really that full funnel, that full stage COE? So this is, I would say, you know, right alongside the um the the fully functioning um abm piece which is essentially now we're taking lead gen and demand gen and account-based marketing strategies and we're combining everything into one process and so that's why we started further back in the webinar kind of looking at demand gen lead gen and abm what are the differences kind of how do they function because the ultimate goal is to combine all of these activities under one umbrella, essentially, because they all will benefit. 
demand gen and lead gen will benefit significantly from an account-based approach. Um, what we've seen that can be really problematic for organizations is if you've got demand gen is doing their thing, digital or lead gen is doing their thing, and then ABM is kind of doing their thing, depending on who it owns it. Um, but they're, they're all different tactics and they're measured differently. Um, and, and oftentimes these departments uh, are gonna be tasked with different metrics as well. So this is really kind of more that change management where we're saying, we wanna combine this. We wanna have flows, account-based flows for lead gen and for demand gen that feeds into the same funnel. We have the ability to nurture these accounts better and so we're being very deliberate about we're running, you know, and I always call one to many, really to me it's demand gen. It's very, very similar. A lot of the tactics are the same. A lot of the, the segmentation can be the same. Where there might be differences, you know, demand gen might be considered your total addressable market, whereas one to many is really more of a, a scaled down, more digestible approach to groups of accounts. Um, and, and you can still stack that total addressable market on the very top of that. Absolutely. So that we have very deliberate, it moves through the funnel organically this way. Um, with regard to lead gen, you know, these leads come in, we take those meetings, we have those in-person meetings at events. That's not the end of it. We know that that's really in many ways, the beginning of a very long cycle, right? Because they're, they're vetting vendors, they're looking for the right fit. We want to continue to provide to them that you know that experience, that excellent experience that ABM provides to the customer journey, and so we want to take that and incorporate lead gen and demand gen into that account-based journey because we know it's more successful that way. It's going to move these accounts with more velocity. It's going to result in higher contract values. It's more repeatable and it's much more reliable. We're looking at pipeline and trying to predict what the outcome of that's going to be in terms of revenue. So this is what ABM on demand looks like from our perspective. And so, you know, it, it's really the beneficiary of all of these steps that come before it. Um, it's, I, I think you could say that this is, you know, even after a center of excellence to a degree, or it could come before. It really sort of depends on how you want to configure it. But, you know, the reality is I think for many organizations, this could be, absolutely a, a, a wonderful destination to end on, which means, you know, from our perspective and definition, you are able to serve to marketing and sales, whomever else, um, ABM campaign styles that fit their needs, right? And so you've got, you know, collaboration with sales. You may have field marketers that kind of interact between marketing and sales as kind of your ABM managers to make sure that those those salespeople are fully supported, that the SDRs are fully supported, that we're all kind of operating continually from that same sheet of music. They might be the ones doing the ongoing meetings, for instance. Um, but ultimately, we're looking to get to a place where we can say to leadership, you know, we can serve one to few or one to one ABM campaigns on demand to the, the entire organization. You know, if you're global, then, then globally. And what does that look like to get there? And again, this is not a, you know, a six month process, um, which is quite literally the reason why it's absolutely critical to say, here is my, my endpoint, here's where I want to get to, and what is my plan to get there? Because you will not very likely, the, the chance of achieving this in, in a serendipitous way is very unlikely. If you go at this and, and do not have a very well formulated plan, just like ABM itself, you don't have a very well clearly defined plan, roles and responsibilities, who does what, what is the benefit to everyone, all operating from the same sheet of music. You, the likelihood of achieving something like this is, is probably close to zero. It's kind of like that, those memes, those funny memes that, you know, I, I think it, the way it goes is that uh, you probably won't get killed by a chicken, but the chance is not zero. I think that from that perspective, you know, this is a close to zero chance of reaching this without a very well formulated plan. So this is, we're getting close to the end of the presentation. I just want to thank everyone. Um, this is, I think the last 
slide of substance. And I want to thank everybody who has taken the time today. We have some time to be able to field any questions, but I just want to kind of go through this real quickly. So we have designed and developed an assessment to help to um, support organizations in their effort to determine how am I going to get to my desired endpoint. Um, it's fairly detailed, and this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, just to kind of give everyone a bit of a glimpse, because there's a lot that goes into creating this process and this roadmap and these benchmarks that we haven't even talked about today. And, and some of those things, you know, like even compliance and legal, um, to really understand what the process looks like to get approval to do stuff. Um, you know, uh, trying to get new tech onto your, your stack could be a year process. And so you want to be able to know well in advance, what does that look like? How are we going to get there? So all of these things kind of put together, turn into your strategic roadmap to achieve whatever your desired end state for ABM is going to be. Um, I think a fully formed assessment really, it, it involves sales. Um, from the beginning because we need to fully understand what is their process right now. Every bit of it, like what happens to an MQL, what happens to an inbound lead, who handles it, how do they handle it, what's the process after that, how does it get dispossessed and how does it move to or not move to an opportunity. So all of this stuff, um, you know, strategies, its own kind of component. So this is quite literally a two-day process with many, many folks from the organization taking part. It can be broken out into different pieces, but you know, there's a lot to uncover in terms of putting the right plan together for each individual organization because it will be 100% custom for each organization. There's, there's pieces that we know are going to be critical to uncover and dig into and understand what is it going to take, um, what's the timeline look like. For instance, again, kind of going back to new tech on your stack, what is the IT approval process for a new piece that we don't have in there? How does integration work? Can we share data back and forth, et cetera, et cetera? So there's a lot that goes into really determining what does the, the roadmap look like. So that's kind of our, I guess, quasi sales pitch, if you will. But that, that really concludes um, our webinar, this whole process. Would love to find out from the folks that are still on the call if you have any questions related to any of the content we talked about, or even if there's anything that we haven't talked about, please feel free to, to ask well. All right, I haven't. Oh, did you get it? I haven't seen any any questions come through. I don't know, Chris or Sarah, if you have. If not, then I would say that concludes our webinar for today. Um, we'll be doing some more of these probably every other month um, for the foreseeable future. So we appreciate everyone's time um, and attendance today. We will have this as a link. Back to the recording, uh, it should be on the uh, ABM agency page. Kelly um, has a, with that. Oh. Kelly, yes, we will make sure to, we're going to send down um, a couple of the slides out after as well. Yes. Yeah, and the, and the full presentation or the webinar is going to be, it is recorded, so you'll be able to access this information as well. Thank you.